Well, what have we been teaching on? Overall, we've been teaching on gifts lately, haven't we? We've been talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And, and today, I just, I'm just kind of going a, a different avenue. I think it's not something I expect you to do when you talk about gifts. Uh, I, I always kind of do the regular things unregular or kind of different. But um, somebody was, I heard somebody preaching on TV. They were doing something. And, and what happens when we listen to other speakers, we get inspired. How many of y'all know that teach, you know, it just gives you stuff you run off with. And they were talking about Joseph. How many of y'all know the story of Joseph in the Bible? Raise your hands. You know Joseph. How many of you don't know the story of Joseph? There's a lot of people. Okay. Well, good. Y'all mostly know it. So uh, it's really one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite characters in the Bible is a young man named Joseph. And I hadn't really realized it, but the whole story of Joseph, really, most of it, he's young. It, and I, I thought about keeping our teenagers in here. But it really, the story of Joseph starts off, and he said he was 17. He was 17 uh, when it picks up the text, when it first mentions a young man named Joseph. And so what you think, what has Joseph got to do with gifts? What I realized is Joseph was a very gifted young man. And Gary just said, the Lord has said, there's a double anointing in the house today he's given you. And, 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 and Joseph was definitely one that had double and triple, and he was anointed to do many things. How many of y'all know some people, like they just struggle to find anything, you know, they're always struggling. But there's some people that seem like they've got, they can do it all, or they've got to do two or three things, or they've got several things that are going on in their life. And it's one thing to be multi-talented, but it's another thing to be multi-anointed. Because it's a, there's a whole difference. There's a people, y'all know this, somebody can sing and sing great, stay on key, get it right, get the rhythm right, and they can be great. And you can say, well, that was really good. But there's somebody else who can get up there and sing the same song and, and may not hit every note right and may miss a beat or two, but you just want to stand up on your feet and give them a standing ovation. What's the difference? There's anointing on some people singing. Some people get to sing. There's something they sing from their gut. There's something that affects others. That means there's something going on with them that's more than just their talent. More than their talent. Well, there was a young man here, this name of, of, of Joseph. And when you think about Joseph, there was a, there's one gift that's kind of predominant we think about. How many, who can think of the gift that, that was real dominant or we think about being dominant in Joseph's life? Dreamer and dream interpreter. Okay, and that's the one I would normally think about. But when I was thinking about Joseph, I realized there was other gifts that we don't even think about. I dare say it right, probably wasn't even his dreaming interpretation of dreams that brought him into fame that we all know about Joseph. There was other gifts, and I want, you to, I want to encourage some of you in the house. You may not be the person up with the microphone. You may not up here singing or playing instruments. But what happens so many times, we think about gifts being something like that, don't we? We think about the people that can sing, the people who can play the guitar, people that can uh, uh, lay on hands and the sick recover. We, the people have gifts of tongues interpretation, all that stuff. And we've talked about them. But I want to tell you, there's some gifts in this book that we don't want to overlook. There's some gifts in this room that we don't want to overlook. Because what happens, we can look at the people that's very open with their gifts. People that are, they're, that are more maybe um, uh, outgoing or people that's more extroverted. They can be heard. But one thing I have learned very quickly when it comes to having groups and stuff, you know, I've always had groups in my home and, and groups. It's the person sitting over there that may not be saying nothing, that hasn't said anything. That before it's over, I need to say, okay, well, uh, Brother Jim, what do you think about this? And this man can be sitting here, and all of a sudden, he starts talking. How many of you know I'm talking about? You're like, oh, my gosh, just, just close it down. Just give him the mic, somebody. You realize that there's gifts there that may not be just in your face. And that's what I want to encourage you today about gifts. And just try to throw some stuff out here with Joseph and some of the gifts that we may not even have realized that he had. And so I, I, I was looking here, and uh, boy, I, I, who knows, I could actually probably teach on Joseph the rest of the year. There's so many uh, lessons in here, and it's so deep. But I thought I'd just kind of pop through the story and hit some of the highlights. Um, because in these highlights, there's like messages, huge messages today that are teachings that you can learn from. But it, I'm going to start with Genesis 37 and 3. And it says, now Israel, that was his father, his name had previously been Jacob. 
Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And he says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Uh-oh. Right there, we just stop. He loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. So he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brothers saw that their brother loved him more than them, they hated him. And they could not speak peaceably with him. Okay, we just will stop right there. Oh, I'll just go on. He dreamed a dream. And behold, he told it to his brethren, and they hated him even yet the more. What happens when your gift brings you into being hated? <laughs> he dreams this dream. Well, I could just talk all day about those three verses right there. Because, first of all, there's an issue when a parent loves, obviously loves one child over the other. Does it happen? It happens. What if one grand, what a grandparent plays partiality with the grandchildren? Oh, we kind of get away with that seemingly, but we don't. This is a big deal right here. It's a big lesson. The brothers hate it. Joseph becomes the target of his brother's envy and wrath, and you'll see what even happened to him. Because he's, first of all, their daddy played favorites. And not only played favorites, but he gives him a coat. Nobody else got this coat of many colors. I thought, who was this saying about that? Wasn't that Dolly Parton? Mm -hmm. They made a movie about it, I think. Called it something about that. That's how famous this is. Dolly's singing about it. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> so, <sighs> oh, Lordy, where do I go? How do I stay here? How do I move on from that? Well, it says why. It says because he was the son of his old age and what that says to me is when you have your children makes a difference of how you can feel about them and how you bond with them has nothing to do with the child i have counseled so many adults in my life that are still hung up i mean it has got them hung up big time because they felt less loved than one of their siblings i'm telling you, you don't get over it because it goes down to the core of who you are. You feel like there's something wrong with me because they like them more. The reality is it had nothing to do with Joseph whatsoever. It had something to do with his parents. It had something to the time of the age of his father. He was a little more relaxed. Y'all know how it is when you have children right in the middle of chaos. I mean, you're doing all this stuff. You might be in the middle of a breakup. All that stuff kind of goes into effect to how you bond with your children and how, how they feel. They didn't even die. You love them the same. You would, you would want to die if any of them died. But the reality is there's some things that happen in our life that has nothing to do with us that can really mess us up if we don't realize this. This is for somebody today. Not, but let me give you a little further. I'm just going to tell you this. It's so interesting about this story. When you start putting these stories together, when I was a child, I knew about Joseph. I knew about Noah. I knew about Daniel the lion's den. We got told all these stories. But what I never got until really in college or in seminary, I took an Old Testament survey. I started putting these people together. I knew it, but I didn't really know it. I didn't realize how one generation affects another. You tell the stories individually, but to really get the picture, you got to get the whole picture. You go a little bit further. This is not just about him being an old man when he had this boy. It was about his mama. Y'all know who his mama was? Who was Joseph's mama? Rachel. What's so special about Rachel? Oh, let me tell you another little story you might have heard that you didn't even put together. There was a young man named Jacob one time that was out, ca uh, out, the, out carrying some sheep, and all of a sudden he looks over and there's a girl like, whoo, y'all ever see? There's a girl. She is love at first sight. He fell in love with a young girl named Rachel, and he's so taken with her. He goes to her father Laban and says, I want to marry your daughter. He said, okay. What did he tell him to do? Work seven years for her and you'll have her. Wow. Okay. Hey, I found something this morning. Just, it is so cute. Here's what, he says what? 
It's like nothing. You taught this in singles class, didn't you? I remember y'all was on You was on it. John was on about, about Rachel falling in love. He's still looking for his, but, you know, just keep praying. It's, it's, there's hope yet. Oh, he says like this. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and it seemed in him but a few days for the love he had for her. Oh, my goodness, he loved Rachel. And what happened to him? He got tricked. Because it said right above that, Laban had two daughters, and the elder's name was Leah, and, and the younger's name was Rachel. And Leah, the older one, was tender-eyed. This is King James. I have no idea what that means, but she had something wrong with her looks. It said she was tender-eyed, and Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. So what did he do? Later on, he said, you don't know our law. You didn't even know. We can't even by law give our younger away till the older one's married. So you know what he did to him? That night on the, they had a little special way of consummating the marriage in his tent, and they kept it low. Apparently the lights were really low, and she had a really good veil because the next morning he wakes up, and the woman he'd been with all night was not Rachel, but it was, it was Leah. It was the uh, uh, older, less attractive. And he did not love Leah. He loved Rachel. So he goes and tells the daddy, he said, I'm sorry. <laughs> he already laughed. He goes, yeah, you can still have Rachel, but you're going to work another seven years. This is man with a, he's a crazy boss, wasn't he? He said, you're going to work another seven years. But you know what he did? He said, I love her. I love her. And so he married. He married Rachel. He got the love of his life. And so he, now he had two. And what was interesting, I could teach all day on Leah. And some of you have been down the Leah road. Leah, he didn't love Leah. She was living in the house with a man, married to a man who didn't love her. He loved her sister. And she knew it. And the Bible says because she was, was not loved, God gave her children. And she has six sons by this man. He may not have, well, anyway, he had babies with her. <clears throat> she wasn't that ugly. I don't know. She has six sons with him. And the seventh, he had a, then she had a daughter. Okay, okay, just ignore that, Emma. Ignore that. Anyway, um, and she has, and then, but Rachel was barren. She couldn't have children. So this man has these children with Leah, and he has seven children, six sons and a daughter named Diana with her. And then he ends up, but she says, look, you can't have babies with me, but I have a surrogate. So she did the Sarah thing, was inherited back, a little back, way back. And he had children with the with their maids. And so finally, after he has six, seven, nine, nine, he has uh, ten kids, ten sons, finally the Lord opened her womb and she had a baby. And Rachel had his first love child. And his name was Joseph. Now does it make sense why Daddy loved Joseph more than everybody else? had nothing to do with that child. It had everything to do with what he inherited. It had everything to do that Joseph loved Rachel. And she has another baby, uh, Benjamin, and then she passes on. But he ends up with 12 sons. You know who these kids end up being? The 12 tribes of Israel. These 12 boys by th four different women all end up being the brothers that are sitting here in this story who hated Joseph. These brothers, now this shows God can use anybody. You're talking about a slow start. These brothers had a slow start. They hated their young brother. They hate him enough, as that, the next chapter goes on, that the father says, look, your brothers are down keeping sheep. He says, I need you to go see them and take, give me a report on them. And here they see him coming. They're like, look at the dreamer. Here comes daddy's favorite, the dreamer. And they're like, why don't we just kill him? And they were going to kill him. But the oldest brother, Reuben, says, nah, just don't kill him. Let's just put him in the pit. And Reuben goes off and does something. While Reuben's gone, a caravan comes by of Egyptians, and they say, why don't we just sell him to them? He said, uh, uh, jo uh, Judah says, why do we want to waste some money? Why aren't we just going to kill him? Why don't we just sell him, and we'll make some money? And they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. You think that ain't prophetic? They sold him into slavery, and all of a sudden you find out here the next picture, this young man. But let me just go ahead and take a sidebar. First of all, he was gifted in dreams. I didn't go into the dreams. But in the dreams, it shows that the brothers are going to bow to him one day. 
They already hated him. He tells them a dream that you're going to bow to me. And they're like, are you kidding me? They hated him more. And then he does a third dream. He does a dream, and he says, Mom and Daddy, and all of you are going to bow to me. And his dad says, Son, what are you doing? In other words, just shut up about this stuff. You ain't helping yourself any. The brothers hated him even more, but Father pondered it in his heart, he said, just like Mary pondered it in her heart. And so uh, this, this boy, he was gifted, but he, was, he had a lot of zeal, but he didn't have, according to much knowledge. Do you know if you let your gift puff you up and start using it, it will going to cause you some real suffering. He caused himself so much pain bragging about his gift. You need to be careful when God has given you a gift that you give glory where glory is due. Amen? Amen? So this made him worse, and so they sell him uh, for 20 pieces of silver. Uh, we go on over here and picking up what happened to him. In the 39th chapter, the first verse says, And Joseph was bought, brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, the, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him out of the hands of the Ishmaelites. That'll, that's a whole deal. Talking about some history going on here. I'm not going to go back further. But, but they, he, they brought him. They, he bought him. This man named Potiphar, he was Egyptian leader. He was an officer. Uh, and so, and, and number two says, And the Lord... 39.2 was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. They saw the Lord was with him. Do people see that the Lord is with you? Leonard said something last week that was so profound. In fact, I've already repeated it and said it to people. I gave him credit. For three times, and after that, it's going to be mine. But anyway, I gave him credit. But he said something to do with, what if the people, so I'm like, job, and I'm going to paraphrase. He goes, what if the people met God, the God in you? If they met God through you, maybe they would believe on him. He was saying, what if you worked with a bunch of atheists? He said, well, if they met God in you, maybe they'd believe on him. Boy, that jumped out at me. Or do people see God in you? If they see God in you and on you, they might believe on him. That's the greatest witness there is. Amen? It's what people see. It ain't what you say. It's what you show. It's who you are. You cannot deny the anointing of God upon you. This young man had anointing to prosper. That word there does not all about money. That word right there, I, I think I wrote it down here. I looked it up. Uh, it says to get ahead. He stood out. He was made effective. He saw this one slave in his house he just bought. There was something different about Joseph. Everything he did, he started to, it would, it would stand out. It was effective. And it would start bringing back something. It was, it was creating some, some prosperity and whatever it was. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. Look at that. Say so he served him. He served him. He served who? This was a master that just bought him off the slave block. He served him. And, he, and so the master, what? Potiphar made him overseer over his house, and all he had he put under his hand. He was a slave in the house, but because he saw that God was with him, and it says in verse 5, it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house over all he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessed Lord was on all that was in the house and in the field. Do you know that wherever you go, that you could be, you're to be a blessing to everywhere you go. You are to be a blessing at the work site. And not only that, but when God, when he, he said for his sake, God blessed the whole house, everybody in the house and the slaves out in the field became blessed because of one man. There was anointing upon him to, to be able to, um, not only to prosper or to make achievements in the house, but y'all, what was about him that he picked him to make him over everybody? Well, let's go on to the next one. You'll see why. Y'all know the story. I have to make this really quick. Uh, it says that uh, he was, Joseph was um, a goodly person and well-favored. And actually, I thought, oh, okay, he's a good man. No, I ain't what that means. It means handsome, like Gary. He was good-looking. He was tall, dark, and handsome. And so what did happen with the good looks? He was blessed with good looks, but what happened? <laughs> and it came to pass after these things, the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me, but he refused. 
It goes on down there in verse 10. It said, it came to pass. She spoke to Joseph day by day. She kept on coming on to him, but he hearkened not to her. There come a day that she tricked him. He was in a the house. They was in there by themselves. And all of a sudden, it must not have been common. He must have been keeping people with him because at that day, he was in there by himself. And so she grabbed him, and, 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 and he just ran out. He left his coat with her. He ran out of the house, left the coat. And what'd she do? She lied on him. She went and said, look here, I got my coat. He come in here and tried to be with me and force himself on me. And, the, and Potiphar's get upset, and he's like, I trusted you, dude. What'd you do with my wife? And he's like, he, I don't know. what. It just shows the next thing he was, he was in prison. They didn't have a, they, it was a speedy trial, all right. It was like, I say, you do this, you're in prison. And so uh, he was a slave. This man who did nothing but serve his master, not fall into the temptation of the master's wife, but he goes to prison. You ever been doing the right thing and all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation like, what is going on? Lord, I was walking with you. You were blessing me. And I thought I was, you know, we were really moving on down the road. We're being prospering. And all of a sudden, I find myself in a situation that I did not ask for. And it does not make sense. I can be honest with you. That's kind of what happened to our family in 18. We had been going on in, in, in 17 and everything in us and everybody's doing good and wonderful. And January the 15th started our, changed our life of our family. Uh, and when all of a sudden, when our niece t took her life. And one thing after another, it was like, what, what? And then there was cancer, and then there was divorce, and then it was disease, and there was another death of a friend, things that happened through the year, and it just doesn't make sense. But you know what? In the middle of that, do you know people still looking at you? It says that he was, the master, Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison, but the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. In the sight of the prison. The man was looking at him. He said, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand. This is, 20, this is uh, 39, if I gave it to you, 39 and 22. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did, he was a doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not on anything that was under his hand because the Lord, he saw the Lord was with Joseph. And what he did, the Lord had made him prosper. He was effective in the prison just like he was in the house. Do you know your gift does not go away just because you're in a dark place? God doesn't stop, stop, stop using you because all of a sudden you don't understand what's happening. And you feel like everybody's looking at you like, what'd you do? What, what's up with you? That's like Job's people. What, how'd you sin, dude? What happened? And you, can, and you know who does it the most? Yourself. We look at ourselves, but you know what? God was with him. You know what I saw in the middle of this? Two different leaders, Potiphar and now the, the jailer, both saw something in him and put him into management. He had a gift of administration. He had a gift of managing people. I, I'd miss that gift. That gift of managing people is what made the difference in Potiphar's house, what made the difference in the prison. There was another gift. It wasn't just, oh, I can dream a dream. Do y'all realize sometimes the fact that you can manage people and do it well is a gift of God? It just kind of comes natural to you. You find yourself. Now, some people, it would be natural, but you're so beat down. You have so many lies in your head about yourself. You, can't even you know you could run that office, but you won't even ask because you, you still got low self-esteem. The Lord said, I need, you, I need you to look and see what I put in you. He's ready to raise some people up if you would get over your hang-ups and say, yes, Lord, I will do that. I will do it afraid if I have to do it afraid, but if you are with me, I will go and do this. Because God don't leave you when you're in the, in the pit. He don't leave you when you're in the prison. Because what he didn't realize, the next step was going to be what? The palace. He was going to go to the palace because while he was in that jail, he was down that prison, he did things well. He was a man of integrity. He didn't only just run away from Potiphar's wife, but when he was there, he served. He served Potiphar, he served in the jail, just like he was serving in the master's house. He did not stop who he was because of where he was. Some of us stop being who we are because whenever we get over here, we're going to be like them. We get over here, we're going to be like them. Young people just like that, isn't it? But I remember looking back, but it ain't all about the young people. It's about us old folks too. 
Sometimes we get in, give in to peer pressure and we forget who we really are because they just don't fit in that situation. Well, you know what? People are like, he's going to take advantage of you. Oh, you know what the Bible tells me about it? I'm going to tell you, you people want to raise up on your job. I'm giving you all some practical teaching today. Is this good? You want to raise up on your job? You just do it when the master's not even looking. You do it because it's who you are. You're a diligent worker. You're a diligent worker because of who you are. In fact, there's some scriptures. Oh, in Ephesians 6 and 6, he said, not, Don't work with as I service as man pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. If you want to prosper, that's what you do. You don't do it because everybody looking at you, well, I'm going to do this because I'm going to teach Sunday school because of this, or I'm going to go out and do this for my boss. No, he said, you do it as unto servants of Christ from, the will of, from your heart. And he said that what, what, what you do in secret, I will bless you openly. There will be a day you will be exalted if you humble yourself. There is a day. It's a promise. Colossians 3.22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. That's in two different letters. It's in the Ephesians letter and the Colossians letter. To don't be doing this according to what's in the flesh, guys. What you do in the flesh is not about this. It's about where you, your heart is with God. Are you taking advantage of the boss? Are you just sitting around complaining and griping all the time? Nobody wants to raise up a complainer. You, I'm telling you, they ain't giving out raises. They don't want to give raises sitting around talking about, about how bad things are. I'm telling, we need to get above that. And let me tell you, with the political season fixed to happen, we need to rise above that. Don't get caught up in all of that stuff. Oh, if I can resist, you can resist. Some of y'all know how deep I can go with, with who I am politically. But let me tell you something. There's something that's more important than politics, and it's who your character is, and it's who you are around. I don't care how they trash talk. Don't fall into that. Don't become like them. Stay above them and just love people where they are. And if you have to keep your mouth shut, keep your mouth shut. Just go vote. All that talk ain't going to matter anyway. All it's going to do is separate you. Let me tell you something. I do not want this church to be where only one party can come in here and feel comfortable with. Y'all might as well accept it. And I'll tell you something. Don't put any political stuff on the, on the Facebook page because I'll take it off. Why? Because that's not what it's about. We're not here to, to persuade you on politics. We're here to raise you up in your integrity. Do I stand for right? Oh, yes, I do. There's some things I'll scream from the tops of mountains. I will talk about, don't be killing no babies on my watch. I will say something. But there's a difference in standing up for what's right than trying to pick policies and try to get into all that mess. Amen? Thank you. Thank you. Because this is who we are and it matters. This matters in this world how I act and how I present myself. And, and, and the integrity that I keep. Guys, you can be gifted all day long. If you don't have integrity, you're going to be in the same pit as a person that ain't got one talent they even think of. What do I say? You can have a gold ring and a pig snout. I right, thank you there, Jason. That supposed to come from Oklahoma. No, I think it comes from the church Bible, actually. Mm -hmm. Joseph was gifted. He was a good administrator. He could dream dreams. He could interpret dreams. He could make money. He could make things prosper. But really, everything that he was is because he was a person of integrity. And he served in that prison. He served his master Potiphar. He served as unto God. Somebody needs to be encouraged this day. You may not think anybody sees what you're doing. But I promise you, your Father in heaven sees. And there's not one thing that's wasted in this kingdom. Because you know what? The longer we do this, we get real discouraging, can't it? You look around and say, well, that ain't happened. This ain't happened. Well, look at there. Look at that. Look at that. Let me tell you something. Any, there's nothing you've done in this kingdom that's wasted. When God looks down on us, he's not in time. Everything is now with God. What you did with a little kid. He said, whatever you do, 
He said, not only are you going to be rewarded in the life to come, but there's rewards in this life. He said, in this life and the world to come. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know where he was going. As far as he's concerned, he'd be in the rest that he could rot in that prison. But in the prison, he still had the gift. And then the 40th chapter, and he said, It came to pass after these things that the butler the king, of the king of Egypt and the baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt, and they got thrown in jail too. So you have a butler and a baker. I don't know about the candlestick maker, but you had the butler and the baker down there in jail. And it come to pass, it says, after a while, he said, actually, he said, um, he put them, the, uh, the, the officer put him over them too. And he said he served them. Oh, and verse 4, the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. He served his other two prisoners. He served a butler and a baker, and they continued a season. We've been talking about seasons. They continued for a season in, under his care in the ward. I taught like two weeks ago, reason and season. Guys, things change. You may feel like you're in the pit right now. You may feel like you're in prison, but things can change like that. It was a season, and what happened in the season? They had a dream. Both of them dreamed. They both had a dream, and, um, and this is what's interesting. I saw today. They didn't tell him about the dream. You know what he does? This is so interesting to me. And Joseph came to them in the morning. He looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers, that were with him uh, uh, there and saying, Wherefore do you look so sadly today? Guys, he paid attention. He'd have missed this opportunity if he hadn't stopped and said, You look sad today. How many people do you miss on the job? How many times do you miss your kids? Oh, I'm in the, I'm, I'm going to go cook supper. Maybe you need to stop right there and go, Why are you so sad, baby? I don't know. You don't know what happened to them. They may not want to tell you because they're embarrassed. Somebody might have picked on them, told them they were ugly, they were fat, they were stupid. They could have said something. You don't know what happened to that child, but that's a big deal to a little kid. They're embarrassed, but you don't know why they're so sad. But if you stop and pay attention and say, why is this sad? You know what? It's not just running around looking for emotions. Here's what it is. It's listening to the Holy Spirit. Father will help you, parent. He will help you in your job. He wants to help you. He's your helper. He's your companion. That's the role of one of the roles of the Holy Spirit to go and go ding, ding, ding. Don't pass that brother this morning. You shook their hand. You might need to go back and say, wait a minute. Are you okay? He said, are you sad? And you know what happened? They told him. They said, okay, let me tell you. We had a dream. They told him a dream. He interprets the dream. He says, you're going to, three days, you're going to be back up. You're going to be pulled up before the king. He goes, the bad news, there's the good news and bad news. He have what you want first. We didn't say it like that, but that's what he good news and bad news. He said, well, you, <laughs> he said, the, but, uh, the baker was going to be hung. He told him, you're going to be called up. He's going to hang you. And, and it was an interpretation of the dream. But the butler, he said, you're going to serve your master again. You're going to be right there. And he says, and don't forget me. When you're there, he said, would you speak to me on the behalf to the king? He says, think of me and it, th when it's well with you. When your hard times are over, don't forget who helped you out. How many somebody needs to help? Remember somebody helped you out in some hard times. Think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness. I pray thee unto me, and make mention of me to Pharaoh, and bring me, so he will bring me out of this house. Well, it goes on, you know what it says? <laughs> Two full years. And then all of a sudden, the king has a dream. The, the guy goes, oh, because first he says, and, and the chief butler did, forgot Joseph. Forgot all about him. Two years later. Two years he forgot about him. Two years doing hard time. And those prisons was not like Texas prisons, which are pretty bad. No, they didn't have any air. Some of the units have air. Don't, don't, don't nod like you know. Don't, don't, don't nod like you know. Two full years and Pharaoh dreamed. And that's when the, he goes, oh, yeah. 
There's somebody who can interpret your dream, interpret it mine. He's down there in prison. His name's Joseph. He pulls him up, and he answers. He gives him the, the, the dream interpretation. These are a lot of life lessons, aren't they? And so he gives it this dream. He tells him all about how there's going to be seven years of famine. That it's going to be, you need to put everything up and, and sock it up because then it's going to be, I mean, for, for seven years of blessing and seven years of famine. And so um, he says now, he told him at the end of it, he tells him this dream. He says, now let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt because this is my advice. Find somebody that's going to handle those good seven years, that's going to handle, carry us through this bad seven years. And so Pharaoh, he said, let Pharaoh do this. And Pharaoh said to his servants, he gets off by himself. He, put, he said, can we find such a one as this man whom the Spirit of God is on? What better person to run my country than him? And he says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, for as much as God has showed you this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. Discreet, man of integrity. And he said, so you will be over my house, according to your word, shall all the people be ruled, and only in the throne will I be greater than you. I've set you over all the land. He took off his ring in his hand, he put it on Joseph's hand, arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain around his neck. He made him ride in the chariot with him. Guys, from the pit to the prison to the palace. And God was with him every step of the way. And now he makes him over the whole country. He's now second in command. And so I've just got to end it with the first that I, was, that I started this whole thing on. Because guys, Joseph could be gifted and Joseph could be a man of integrity but I'm going to tell you what made the difference in the end of the story let me read you this 45 and 1 now this is after the famine and his brothers are in Egypt and they're all starving to death they think their brother's dead right they're, over, I mean, they're in Israel. They're still back in Canaan land. It wasn't Israel. It was Canaan land. And they're starving to death. His dad says, you need to go down to Israel and, see if, and uh, go to Egypt and see if we can get some grain from them because they got grain put up. So he sends his boys down there. I want to do the whole story. You need to read the story. But finally, after the whole thing is over, the last time they're standing in front of the they don't recognize him the whole time, right? He looks like an Egyptian. Looks like, that's a song, ain't it? I'm about ready to do a dance right there. I, I better not. I won't do it right. I'm not a dancer. I have other gifts. So, uh, 45, then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. For, he's standing here in front of his brothers. And he cried. Cause every man to go out from me. He tells everybody, leave the room. Everybody, everybody leave the room. And he stood, there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard him. Now, can you imagine how you felt if your 11 siblings threw you, sold you into slavery? And now you are here 13 years later. 13 years later. He's now 30. He's standing for, he starts weeping so loud that everybody in the house heard him. That sounds like a whole lot of pent-up emotion. I've seen some of you do it at these altars. Some people don't want to cry. They're afraid if they start crying, they won't ever stop. I'm going to tell you something. This is the place to cry it out. Cry it out. He cried until he could not cry anymore. He cried aloud. And Joseph said then to his brother, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? My daddy's old now. Is my daddy alive? And his brother could not even answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Can you imagine? You're standing before the second highest command of the land. You took 20 pieces of silver and sewed him into slavery. They couldn't even speak. And Joseph said to his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I'm Joseph. Again, I'm Joseph, your brother, who you sold. Huh. He had to put this in there. Who you sold to Egypt. <laughs> Therefore, be not grieved. 
I love this. He said, don't be angry. This is verse 9. Don't be grieved nor be angry with yourselves that you sowed me hither. For God did send, before, send me before you to preserve life. And for these two years, has a famine been, a famine been the land? Yet there's our five years. But anyway, I'm not going to go into all that. But he says, God, that was, I'm going to stop with verse 5. He said, he sent me before you to preserve life. God had a plan all along. Do you imagine that you might be a part of God's plan? He has the plans. He said, I know the plans I have for you. They're, they're good plans. That'll bring you to an expected end. I, I, I have a hope for you, a hope, an expectation. I've got some stuff laid out for you. He said, they're right there. He said, all along. He said, don't, don't. He said in verse, if God sent me before you to preserve you, the prosperity of the earth, that save your lives by a great deliverance. It was not you that sent me hither, verse 8, but God, he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a Lord to all his house, a ruler throughout all of Egypt. And I want to end with verse, I think it's over here in the last part, the, the last 50. And this is a famous part of the story. And he says, and his brothers went, and this is after daddy had died, and after daddy, they go back and bury him and all this stuff. They think about it. They go, oh, wait a minute. He's still going to do it to us. They could not believe he was really going to forgive them. They said, he's just been waiting till daddy's dead. Now he's going to get us. Mm -mm. he said his brothers went down and fell them on their face and they said behold we'll just be your servants don't kill us we'll be servants and Joseph said to them fear not for am I in the place of God for as for you you thought evil against me but God meant it unto me to good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive so therefore, fear not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spoke kindly to them. Proverbs eighteen sixteen said, A man's gift makes room for him, and he brings him before great men. Your gifts will bring you into great places. Your gifts can bring you there, but it's your integrity that will keep you there. I've seen a lot of gifted people rise and fall because they did not know how to walk with God and be the same. Proverbs 20 and 7 says, A just man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. Do you know they're watching? And let me tell you this, I don't care how you've lived thus far. We all have regrets, so don't get hung up in what I could have, would have, should have business and just say, what well, I can do today. God can able to restore. He's able to restore the years that the canker worm has eaten. You, they just got to see the miraculous power of change. You can say, honey, you, you, might, you know what sorry person your daddy was, your mama was, but look here, God is good and God is changing me. And no matter what mistakes you make in life, if you will walk with God, he'll be faithful to you. Your failure can become the greatest message you've ever had. It's the story of grace. It's not because mom and daddy did it all right. It's because mom and daddy loved God and they just kept on walking through the pit, through the prison, and they end up in the palace. And you know what? The palace wasn't the end. There's still stories that go on. Nobody stays right here all the time. And they say, amen. It's like this. It's like this. It's like this. But ever up and ever down, the God on the mountain is still the God in the valley. And that's from a song I didn't write that. It's pretty cool. I wished I had. It was a big seller. Psalms 25 and 20, oh, my soul, deliver me. Let me not be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Get, get, get hung up in your shame. Get rid of it. For I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I will wait on thee. You need to wait. Some of you are in the pit. Wait on him. You're in the prison. Wait on him. You're in Potiphar's house. Wait on him. God is faithful, and he'll bring it out, and he'll work it for your good. Or this word is a big, fat lie. And I don't believe it's a lie. I believe he takes it all and turns it around for our good. What made him great, number one, he was faithful in the small things. Joseph served. He was faithful in little things. We've been teaching that. Then number two, he kept his in integrity. 
He didn't commit adultery. He didn't fall into those things. He was patient when he was in a prison. He kept his integrity. He was working when the boss was looking when the boss wasn't looking. That's integrity. Number three, he was patient. He waited it out. He waited out. He continued in prison. Even after being forgotten, he continued doing the next right thing. And number four, he used his gifts boldly no matter where he was at. He was bold in those gifts no matter where he was at. And number five, what made him the most powerful was his ability to forgive. If he hadn't forgave those brothers, all the gifts, all the integrity would not have mattered. It comes down to can you forgive? Jesus said, don't even lay it to their charge. Philip said the same thing. Don't even make them pay God. Now, that's great. I'm like, look, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. You better go get them. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, I, but the greatest is, Lord, don't even make them pay. You don't know why they're acting that way. You don't know that his mama didn't, his, his daddy didn't love his mama. Maybe that's why Reuben was acting the way he was, that's why Judah was. His mama was not Rachel. One of them boys, his mamas was a slave. Their, their mothers were slaves, some of those brothers. You don't know why one person acts the way they act. We cannot judge these people. We just got to be me. I got to keep my integrity. I cannot judge people. I cannot say, well, they do it, I do it. They don't do it, I don't have to do it. No, at some point, it's about me and you, God. That's what I try to tell our teenagers. At some point, I told a parent yesterday, at some point, it's you, you got to get them the place. That no matter what is happening, whether it's mama, whether it's daddy, whether whoever, this is who I am at that school. When nobody's watching, this is who I am. And it's hard. We need to be with our kids and pray for our kids like we did last week. But it's not just about kids, it's us too. Let's get a song. He was able to forgive. Luke 6 and 31. As you would that men do to you, do also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. But if you do good to them that do good to you, what thankful is that to you? Oh, I love them that love me. If you do good to me, I'm going to do good for you. You don't do good to me, I'll get you and I'll get you first. Mm -mm, that's not the way of Jesus. If you lend hoping to receive, then what thank have you? Sinners lend to sinners. But love your enemies and do good and lend and hope for nothing again. And your reward will be great. You will be the children of the highest, for he is kind and to the unthankful and even to the evil. So be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful.